Buenas tardes. Hello, everyone. It's a privilege and an honor to be here with all of you and with our panelists. So I'll first introduce the session, our aims, and then I'll introduce our panelists. So today, we'd like to address women's access and usage of financial services and its barriers and challenges and ways to overcome that. We'd also like to discuss the potential of micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises to increase labor force participation of women. And finally, we would love to touch on the potential of technologies to provide alternate sources of financing and enable more fair rules of commerce. So with me, I'm pleased to introduce to my right, Alfred Hanick. Alfred is the executive director of the Alliance for Financial Inclusion, which is a global network of policymaking and regulatory institutions from more than 90 countries dedicated to providing the world's unbanked safe access to the formal financial system through smart policy initiatives. He's also offered, authored several publications focused on financial inclusion policy, regulatory issues, and microfinance. Next, we have Rebecca Roof. Rebecca is responsible for leading, leading peer learning and knowledge programs for the Global Banking Alliance for Women, which is a consortium of financial institutions that focus on building women's wealth worldwide. She's also in charge of managing GBA's gender data analytics initiative. And Ms. Roof has over 15 years of experience in international finance, having worked previously for Women's World Banking, where she specialized in gender-focused analytics. Next, we have Hema Sakristan. She is the CIO of IDB Invest, the private sector arm of the IDB Group. And from 2012 to 2015, she managed the financial markets division at the IDB. Before joining the IDB Group, Hema held several management positions in commercial and investment banking in New York, London, and Madrid. And finally, we have Denise Ferreira. She is the country director in Argentina of ProMujer. Prior to ProMujer, her career was concentrated in HR planning and development. She served as a member of the board of directors of the Development and Training Association of Argentina and currently serves as president of RADIM, which is the Argentine Network of Microcredit Institutions. She graduated from Educational Sciences and holds a master's in business administration I'd like to start with Alfred, and we take this at a very high level first and talk about the importance of policy reform at the national level. So Alfred, from your perspective, what is the role of policy and regulations in financial inclusion of women? And specifically, what are your partners in central banks and financial regulators doing to promote women's financial inclusion in their national strategies? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, and uh, <clears throat> thank you very much to the W20 for inviting us to this extremely important event. We are very honored to be here. And we, of course, appreciate also the opportunity to be a co-chair for this work stream. Um, I must say that uh, it's very important that W20 and G20 has taken this up, but at this stage, I already would like to say it's very important also to bring non-G20 country experience to the table. We at AFI, I think we stand for both um, emerging economies in the G20, but as well for the non-G20 countries. And most of the innovations we are going to talk about today are actually happening outside. Uh, the G20, so it's very important to get this knowledge to the table. Now, as you said, AFI is a network of central bankers and regulators um, who drive financial inclusion through, as they say, uh, smart policies and regulations. And uh, there is one big statement that the network has made two years ago, which is the Denarao Action Plan, which is actually our global commitment uh, to narrow down the gender gap in financial inclusion. And this has been endorsed by 98% of uh, regulators from emerging and developing countries. This, I must say, is a huge statement. If 98% of these regulators deal with an issue with what they have not dealt before. I can tell you a few years ago when I um, talked at sidelines of conferences with uh, financial regulators and central bankers, I very often got the question, yeah, it might be important to include women, but why are we talking about it as central bankers? Why is it our role? Because many of them, I think, made the same mistake that we heard in the previous session about, which is they thought that, gen that uh, these policies are gender neutral. And we were arguing they are not gender neutral. And we will come back to this. <clears throat> now, through the general action plan, we are addressing financial inclusion issues uh, through uh, work streams on national strategy, through work streams on financial education um, and literacy, through work, work streams of digital financial services and so forth. And we have seen 30 country commitments um, worldwide uh, by countries uh, to bring down um, the gender gap. And the, the members have actually um, also committed not only to narrow down the gender gap, but also to half the gender gap by 
2021, which is, a, I think, a great uh, statement. We are, we are working on this. Now, all these work streams have a gender dimension, so we have not put up one single working group which is just dealing with these issues. This is a cross-cutting issues which runs through all our um, activities. And what is also important to note is that, that central bankers and um, regulators have come on board has a lot to do with the fact that one has recognized that including women is extremely important for economic growth and poverty alleviation. And I just wanted to give you this number because it's quite striking. It comes from McKinsey Global Institute, <coughs> um, saying that financial inclusion is increasing economic growth. They're saying uh, that gender equality could dramatically unlock an estimated 12 billion trillion, sorry, 12 trillion US dollars of incremental GDP in 2025 with financial and particularly digital inclusion being among the key enablers. So I think uh, this shows that it is very, not only important to include women, we also have to say that full financial inclusion is only possible if we fully include women. And this means we would have to include one uh, billion uh, women out there. Now, there are examples. Uh, Bank of Zambia, for example, introducing gender disaggregated data collection methodologies to inform policy making. Bangladesh Bank to uh, introduce biometric identification for lower know your customer requirements for women, uh, particularly uh, illiterate women, and of course, uh, Bank of Tanzania with specific focus in the national strategy in financial inclusion. So the gender gap is still stubborn, uh, we know that, uh, but we need to do more, and I think with the support of the W20, financial regulators and policymakers can help uh, to drive the gender gap. Uh, perhaps some point towards zero, but I think in the next uh, session we will also talk about why it is so complicated and why it takes time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alfred. I was, oh, yes. I was, struck, I was struck by your comment about the importance of gender neutrality, and you also mentioned um, gender disaggregated data. So we know where it's been said that if you can't measure it, you can't manage, manage it. And I'm thinking about the importance this morning of, of governance and holding our countries and ourselves accountable and the power of data to do that. And so I'd like to ask Rebecca, so could you help us understand what is gender disaggregated financial data and why it's so important to uh, financial inclusion of women and policy reform? Um, sure. Uh, firstly, thank you so much for the invitation. Delighted to be here and also work very closely with AFI as a co-chair of the financial inclusion subgroup. Um, as you said, what, what you can't measure uh, is not done. Um, so data is vital for women's financial inclusion. If we can understand how far we are, how far we have come, and how far we still have to go, then we don't really know what we're doing. Um, what we see is, is in, in terms of data for financial inclusion, we're still missing even some of the mo most basic data um, disaggregated by gender. So for instance, um, data can be at the national level. This is data that really regulators and, and policymakers need to understand who is served, who is unserved, what proportion of women are the ones that are being unserved, and how to develop the proper policies to be able to um, address these gaps. And AFI has been doing a wonderful job um, with its network to really focus on that. Um, but we also need data at the institutional level, at the financial service providers level, because this really gives you a picture of, of the women's market uh, understand how big it is, um, and really know if you're serving a customer or not. Um, so certainly data is, data is absolutely necessary at both the national level and the institutional level, but I would like to talk a little bit more about um, the private sector, the role of, of supply side data, data that comes from financial service providers, as, as that is uh, a lot of the work that we do. Um, when I talk to a lot of financial service providers, and I tell, they, they tell me there is no gender gap. Um, we were talking about gender neutral. Uh, they, they treat all customers the same, and therefore, they know they're serving women. That's the answer I get many, many times. Um, however, when I ask them, how many women customers <coughs> are you serving? 99% of the time, they cannot answer that question. They don't know how many women are actually in their portfolio. Uh, for the brave ones that actually go back and check, um, they will find that, in fact, they're not 50-50. Uh, most of the time, they're serving, especially the commercial uh, players, are serving a lot less women than they thought. So just to give you an example of the magnitude of the gap, we conduct a, member, a survey of our members every year. Uh, and please note that our members are the ones that are developing strategies, that are developing 
approaches for women. So these, these are the converts. Um, and our data shows that GBA members' customer base is only 36% female. And when you look at credit, it's only 23% of the credit that is actually going to women. Um, this includes about 25 banks from 23 countries, so not a large sample size, but it does represent 32 million cu women customers. Um, so again, it does not look good. Um, if there is no data, the private sector cannot develop a business case. You, we need a business case to make a commercially viable strategy to make sure that we are able to target women customers um, adequately. Um, so what we have seen when we look at our members' data, we see that um, women customers report higher growth rates. Uh, they perform, uh, they, they also uh, have lower non-performing ratios, which means they're better repayer. This is across the board, across countries and across segments. And they also have greater deposits. So if women are such good customers for a bank, you have to wonder what's happening. Why are they uh, not being served? Um, so with these questions, we really want to try to solve this issue, and we've partnered together in the Women's Financial Inclusion Data Partnership. Uh, AFI is also part of it, as is the IFC, the IDB, IDB Invest, um, as well as other, the IMF and other players, uh, to really try to solve this, this issue. Um, so to you, what I tell you today is if you work at a bank, start looking at your data and start asking questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you work at a government, start asking questions about the financial system and how many women are you actually serving? Basic, basic questions. And if you're a customer, uh, demand better service or switch. Uh, and finally, to W20, I, I would really um, advocate putting data at the top of the, of the priority um, and communicate. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rebecca. So if we stay in the, the private sector for a moment and drill down perhaps to some very specific examples, I'd like to ask him, uh, what are you doing or what is IDB Invest doing for the financial inclusion of women in Latin America and the Caribbean? Muchas gracias. Eh, sin duda alguna, estar un, eh, un placer estar aquí hoy con todos ustedes. Si me permiten, voy a hablar en, en castellano eh, al estar en Argentina y ser mi, mi idioma. Eh. Gracias. Bueno, a lo largo del día se han dado muchas cifras y si me permiten eh, voy a dar algunas, muy pocas, para poner un poco en contexto la oportunidad, la oportunidad del mercado de la mujer para el sector financiero. A día de hoy eh, el mercado de la mujer es el mayor, en la mayor oportunidad económica del mundo. Las mujeres consumimos aproximadamente 28 trillones de dólares, generamos a través de la actividad económica en la que cada una de Nosotras trabajamos aproximadamente 18 trillones de dólares, lo que aproximadamente representa más de la suma del Producto Interior Bruto de Estados Unidos y de China. Además, influimos en el 80% de las decisiones de compra y el 33% de las empresas de todo el mundo son propiedad de mujer. Sin embargo, sin embargo en Latinoamérica y el Caribe, a pesar de que el 70% Eh, de las empresas eh, lideradas por mujeres eh, que representan aproximadamente una, una oportunidad financiera de 98.000 millones de dólares eh, no están servidas por los bancos. Es decir, hay una oportunidad de casi 100.000 millones de dólares de financiar a estas mujeres y los bancos no están viendo la oportunidad. Por otro lado, como decía Rebeca, hay evidencia empírica que dice que las mujeres pagan mejor Las mujeres son mucho más fieles a sus bancos, cambian menos de banco y también son muy buenas voceras. Es decir, cuando un banco nos gusta y un servicio nos gusta, pues solimos, eh, solemos referenciarlo a nuestros amigos y también a nuestras familias. Con lo cual, por un lado, nos encontramos una gran oportunidad de negocio para los bancos y por otro lado, algo que parece ser una buena base de clientes potencial. Entonces, ¿qué es lo que está pasando? ¿Qué pasa que hace que todos estos bancos no estén viendo esa oportunidad financiera. Bueno, nosotros desde BIT Invest, el eh, banco del grupo BIT que trabaja con el sector privado, básicamente eh, intentando contribuir al, al, al desarrollo sostenible de América Latina y el Caribe, nos hemos puesto esto como una de nuestras grandes metas. 
En el año 2012 lanzamos un programa llamado Women en Pornos y Banking Web, que básicamente trabaja con bancos para ayudarles a ver esa oportunidad financiera. Hemos trabajado a día de hoy con 17 bancos en 11 países. Les hemos dado más de 600 millones de dólares y 5 millones en asistencia técnica, básicamente para ver toda esa eh, oportunidad financiera. Hay evidencia también que muestra que las mujeres no solo necesitan productos financieros, también necesitan tener training, especialmente todo lo que tiene que ver con gestión, con gestión financiera, tener acceso a redes y, muy importante, el networking. Las mujeres, como sabemos, nos gusta juntarnos y nos gusta tener una vida social también alrededor eh, de nuestros negocios. Hemos trabajado con muchos bancos, eh, como he dicho, pero me gustaría hablar de uno en particular, eh, de Banco Itaú, a día de hoy, como saben, el mayor banco de Brasil y el mayor banco regional en América Latina y el Caribe. Ellos crearon, con nuestra ayuda, un programa eh, llamado Mujer Emprendedora, Mujer Emprendedora que básicamente eh, intenta servir a las eh, eh, MIPIMES de su país, a las micro, pequeñas y medianas empresas, con un enfoque eh, principalmente en las micro, aunque esto está, está cambiando. Solamente en los, dos primeros años, en los dos primeros años de actuación de este programa, básicamente su cobertura creció de un, creció de un 22 a un 34%. Con lo cual ellos han sabido, han sabido ver una clara oportunidad en desarrollar programas, programas que intentan cubrir las necesidades financieras de estas eh, empresas o de estas empresarias. A lo largo de estos años, desde el 2012, han pasado ya pues, seis años, eh, hemos aprendido algunas cosas, algunas cosas que han funcionado y otras que no. Pero creemos que ha habido una muy importante que podemos decir que... Ha sido una, eh, una tendencia general en todos estos bancos. Hemos visto que es muy difícil, muy difícil ser el banco de la mujer si no eres el empleador de la mujer. Entonces, también estamos trabajando con bancos para que empiecen a ver la propuesta de valor a sus propias empleadas, a crear programas de liderazgo que verdaderamente promuevan esa equidad de género en su propia estructura. Con lo cual, por un lado, les ayudamos a ver la oportunidad en ese mercado femenino, mercado de la mujer, ¿no? lo que llaman en inglés el women's market, pero también en su propia estructura. Y ahí, bueno, les ayudamos con eh, cambio de políticas, mejora, toma de nuevas prácticas y también eh, algunas oportunidades de programas de liderazgo y de, y de, y de mentoría. En este sentido, también recientemente lanzamos una herramienta que se llama WEP, con P, eh, Women Empowerment Principles Gap Analysis, con ONU Mujeres y con algunos otros eh, socios estratégicos. Y básicamente lo que les permite a todos estos bancos es medir, medir dónde están en todas esta, estas estrategias de género. Medir por una razón. Primero, porque es muy, muy difícil eh, tomar acción si no sabes dónde estás. Y luego porque en el fondo tienes que también compararte con otros actores eh, del mercado, no solamente donde tú operas, sino a nivel internacional, para tomar lo mejor eh, de lo que ha funcionado e intentar evitar aquellas cosas que no lo han hecho. Eh, eh, y desde entonces, bueno, en estos últimos dos años hemos trabajado con 25 eh, entidades, estamos aprendiendo mucho eh, y, creemos, y creemos que es eh, fundamental, como decía, eh, intentar ayudar al sector financiero a ver esa oportunidad de financiación de la mujer, pero sin esa sensibilidad de también querer ver dentro de su propia casa de cuáles son las oportunidades, es muy difícil de hacerlo. Con lo cual, con ese sentido, hemos estado trabajando desde, desde Bitinvest en programas pioneros para ayudar a la mujer empresaria de América Latina y el Caribe a través de todos estos eh, bancos locales. Muchas gracias. Gracias, señor. Now I'd like to move to the, to the more individual level. It's really important to ensure we don't exclude uh, anyone. And this question is for Denise. What conditions do you believe should be in place to financially include our vulnerable and excluded populations? Eh, bueno, buenas tardes. Muchísimas gracias por la invitación y el honor de compartir este, este panel y este ámbito tan especial. Eh, primero, mm, no traje mis notas, no es que no las hice sino que estaba, pre preparé mis notas eh, y pensaba recorriendo cada uno de eh, los factores o condiciones que necesita una persona, sobre todo una mujer, que eh, se encuentra en una situación de vulnerabilidad. Eh, 
Y empecé a recorrer y pensaba, bueno, necesita eh, información clara, precisa, transparente, sin letra chica, necesita eh, productos diseñados para el uso de los servicios que quiere, eh, que quiere utilizar, para, el para qué quiere servicios financieros. Eh, necesita eh, educación financiera para tomar eh, decisiones adecuadas, necesita eh, cercanía, proximidad, accesibilidad, conectividad. Y cuando estaba terminando mi lista dije, bueno, pero esto es en realidad lo que necesitamos todos. Eh, todos, no importa eh, clientes de qué seamos, lo primero que necesitamos es que nuestro proveedor nos reconozca como, como un cliente con derechos y obligaciones. Eh, que reconozca mi particularidad, que me conozca. Eh, y eh, frente a esto, lo que necesitamos es que realmente se haga un trabajo, y esto es muy complementario de lo que se dijo ya en el panel, necesitamos que se reconozca como un segmento que tiene que ser estudiado, que tiene que ser analizado, conocido, para poder justamente desarrollar y entregar esos servicios a la medida de, eh, del uso que necesita hacer la mujer. ¿sí? Que la mujer sí tiene una conducta distinta frente a los servicios financieros. Cuando yo trabajo en una organización que atiende a, eh, actualmente a 250.000 eh, mujeres microemprendedoras. Eh, y cuando analizamos el uso que hace eh, de los microcréditos, eh, lo que vemos es que sí el uso puede ser distinto del que hace el hombre y eh, lo que vamos a ver con, cuando una mujer tiene acceso a inclusión financiera es que eh, se, se observa una mejor eh, alimentación de la familia, se observa eh, mayor inversión en la educación de los hijos, eh, se observa una mejor, eh, un mejor acceso a los servicios de salud. Este es el destino que hace la mujer de los servicios financieros cuando los tiene. ¿sí? Eh, entonces, es una inversión, esta inclusión financiera de la mujer es una inversión eh, en el bienestar general, ¿sí? en el bienestar común. Eh, y no porque la mujer no aspire a tener un negocio rentable, eh, escalable, grande, sino porque... Eh, un poco también por la tradición de su rol, ha permanecido, también ha tenido todas las necesidades de la familia, pero también es la gran oportunidad de desarrollar este tipo de servicios adecuados y accesibles para la mujer. Gracias, Denise. So I'd like to incorporate questions from the audience into our next round here. And going back to Alfred and thinking about the promise of digital financial services, this question is, um, as proven in countries such as India, digital ID policies have shown to be effective. Can you let us know which are the main barriers to implementing those kind of policies? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Uh, on, the, on the digital financial services um, and, the, and the promise, I think we, we are very aware we have one, one billion uh, unreached women in the world, but we have 600 million uh, women among those one billion who actually have a mobile phone. And the question is, why don't they use it and get access to digital financial services. And indeed, we have also seen a lot of progress in the last year, only we saw the number of women using digital payments have increased uh, to 40%, which was formerly 30%. So there is movement. But it is also interesting to see that, and we see, of course, uh, the role of biometric identification, which is an important means the financial education for women, which is an important means, even financial consumer protection, which is important. But we do see also um, uh, some developments which should caution us. And you're mentioning India, and this is interesting because India is among the countries that have moved very, very fast on digital financial inclusion. And as you know, in the last Global Findex, uh, which covers 2014 to 2017, uh, we have actually seen that uh, 457 million Indians have been banked just in three years. And many of them are women. But now it is also astonishing to see that 48%, almost 50% of this big number, uh, these are dormant accounts. They're not used. They're dormant. And why are they dormant? And this, I think, uh, points us clearly to how can we, in fact, help small customers, including women, to understand financial services, to use financial services. And that brings me back to the very important question that I think Sonia uh, in the previous uh, panel brought up, she talked about digital inclusion and the necessity of utilization. It's the same story in uh, digital financial inclusion. Usage is extremely important. 
Um, but there's also another uh, cautioner which I want to bring out, and this is important also for the W20. Um, technology comes with risks, and regulators are very concerned about risks. Now, bl uh, blockchain technology, machine learning, big data, uh, bi biometric identification, you have it. That all comes with risks, especially for those ones who are not literate. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that these small customers who get exposed to these new technologies are protected. And that, again, brings me back to usage and quality of financial services. Because if we don't do that, we might face a situation where this hype around financial inclusion can actually convert into a backlash against financial inclusion. And that would actually mean a backlash against financial inclusion is also a backlash against women's financial inclusion. So we need to work very hard to make sure that access is complemented by usage and quality of financial service. And that brings us to everything I said, market conduct, financial education, financial capability, awareness. That is where we have to start, and that's very bottom up. And I think that's why we are here, because we also understand that regulators have to take this perspective. I don't want to go on. It's a very interesting topic, but there are other panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you to the audience for the question. Um, so we only have a few minutes left. We'll try to get through the rest of the panel again. Um, and to, to Rebecca, uh, so I'm curious, how can commercial financial institutions incorporate better practices to include women in financial services? And I'm specifically thinking about why is a strong internal diversity and inclusion practice important to serving women customers? Um, absolutely, and I think this usage question is also quite relevant to this. Um, but what we've seen is that banks' traditional business models have focused on being gender neutral. However, this has really come, to, come at an expense, and the expense has been mostly to women. Um, and it's really important, as, as was, was said already, for banks to recognize that women and men make financial decisions differently. Um, and they really need to approach uh, things uh, from a gender intelligent approach. Um, and it is not about putting one customer before another one, putting one customer first, no. It's about being a customer-centric institution. And I think a lot of other industries and sectors have, have recognized this and really embedded customer-centric approaches. Unfortunately, the financial services industry has been very slow to do this. Um, and this involves a number of things, um, including uh, making sure that you have a, that, that that you manage the, the barriers to capital, like reducing collateral problems, a lot of the, thing that Hem, a lot of the things that Hema mentioned in, in terms of non-financial services. Um, we see that women need more information to make decisions, they need more time. Um, many women tend to be less financially literate, so they need more financial education, as Alfred was saying. Networking is a, is a big issue. Uh, one study we saw that on average women have 15 people in their network, whereas men have 80. And there's a direct correlation between a business's success and the, and the size of their network. And recognition is also very important. Women tend to be less visible. So all of these areas are areas where financial institu institutions can really make a difference. And we've seen a lot of our, me our members um, establish programs. To answer the second question, internal diversity is absolutely key. Um, what we've seen in the practices from our banks is that there's, there's a lot of uh, research out there that shows the business case of internal diversity. So for instance, McKinsey showed that the most diverse companies at the executive level were actually 20% more likely to outperform others in profitability. So the business case has been made. What has not been made is really the case of uh, being the employer of choice for women and also being the bank of choice for women. So what we see um, in our network is that there's a number of benefits that really will help women customers in becoming an internal diversity uh, institutions. Just a couple of examples. One of our members in the UK, the, Euro, the Royal Bank of Scotland group, set up an internal women's network about 10 years ago. And this was really pivotal in increasing women's visibility and helped boost their women in business program as well. Um, in Lebanon, BLC Bank um, had a very strong program for women they developed a, a customer program. And that actually signaled the market that they were a strong employer for choice. And the number of applications from women skyrocketed just because of this. So there's a really strong symbiotic relationship between being an, a good employer for women and being a good bank for women. Thank you. So we have just a few moments left, and I'd like to have more forward-looking questions to the future. Sister Hema, um, what opportunities do you see in the future for the financial inclusion of women? 
Bueno, desde nuestro punto de vista hay una tendencia que está llegando a algunos de los mercados, todavía no tanto en América Latina y el Caribe, pero que tiene que ver con lo que se llama la inversión eh, con lentes de género. Básicamente es una estrategia que ha surgido recientemente, como digo, y que, y que busca eh, que a través de las inversiones se obtengan rentabilidades eh, financieras, pero que también se avance en la, en la equidad de género. Básicamente estas lentes o estas eh, gafas de género representan una gran oportunidad, eh, obviamente para las mujeres y también para el inversionista, y podrían tener eh, tres tipos de, de ejemplos. Uno, invertir en empresas cuyos productos y servicios ayuden a mejorar o avanzar en, en equidad de género, como decía. Otra, invertir en empresas propiedad de mujeres o lideradas por mujeres. Es un poco lo que decía Rebeca y lo que hablaba yo antes de, en, en el caso de los bancos, enseñarles a ver esa, esa oportunidad, pero lo hay en otros sectores, el automovilístico, el de las casas, las hipotecas, etc. Y luego invertir en empresas que tengan políticas y, y programas que promuevan eh, la equidad de género dentro de su propia eh, o, eh, organización. Hay diferentes tipos de activos en los cuales uno puede invertir si quiere verdaderamente utilizar su dinero para promover la equidad de género. Tradicionalmente han venido de las microfinanzas, poco a poco bancos, eh, cada vez más eh, fondos de inversión y recientemente incluso bonos de género. Ha habido un banco en Chile, Banco Estado, que ha sido pionero en lanzar estos, estos fondos y ha tenido mucho éxito haciéndolo eh, en eh, Japón, donde hay una, una, unos tipos de inversionistas que tienen mucho interés en todos estos bonos sociales eh, y de género. Eh, y luego recientemente han salido muchos índices que ayudan a los inversionistas a nivel institucional o, al, o a nivel individual como nosotros mismos a ver cuáles son esas buenas prácticas que hacen las empresas y decidir si queremos invertir en ellos o no eh, porque son pioneros o porque al menos predican con el ejemplo y son empresas que están llevando a cabo buenos eh, proyectos eh, por esa equidad de género. Uno, eh, probablemente el, más, eh, el que más éxito tiene a día de hoy, es el eh, Bloomberg Gender Equality Index. Eh, hay a día de hoy más de 100 empresas y de esas hay cuatro bancos latinoamericanos, Banorte en México, Santander a nivel global, Santander en Chile y también Itaú y BBVA. Con lo cual, poco a poco vemos, vemos que hay mucho, eh, muchas más eh, oportunidades para invertir en este tipo de cosas. Pero también creemos que tenemos que seguir innovando, que tenemos que intentar buscar nuevas soluciones financieras para promover toda esa equidad. ¿no? Y recientemente nosotros hemos eh, generado un producto muy innovador que ha tenido eh, mucho éxito y que básicamente lo que hace es unir esfuerzos con clientes a los cuales les damos un beneficio en la tasa, es decir, les bonificamos el precio de sus préstamos si llevan a cabo eh, con éxito, obviamente, ciertos proyectos eh, que promuevan esa inclusión y esa diversidad que estamos eh, buscando. Lo hemos hecho con mucho éxito en Óptima Energía en México y también eh, con dos proyectos en Argentina, de los cuales nos sentimos muy orgullosos, la Castellana y Achiras, dos proyectos energéticos bajo el programa Renovar, que se ha llevado a cabo eh, recientemente en Argentina para impulsar el uso de las energías renovables. Ahí hemos trabajado con estas empresas para que creen programas para incluir en su fuerza laboral a mujeres en STEM, eh, para eh, coliderar con ellos el desarrollo de programas eh, de liderazgo y de training y también para ayudar, por qué no, a que mujeres eh, empiecen a trabajar en algunos sectores o en algunos oficios que tradicionalmente han estado más dedicados al hombre, como puede ser eh, poner eh, paneles solares. ¿no? Con lo cual, en este sentido, creemos que tenemos que seguir continuamente innovando para unir esfuerzos con distintos actores del sector financiero, porque, como he dicho anteriormente, el reto es muy importante y existen distintas oportunidades, no solamente las microfinanzas o los bancos, sino cada vez más eh, tipos de inversiones alternativas que también, que también se pueden poner ese lente de género y verdaderamente contribuir a tener una sociedad mucho más eh, equitativa y, sin duda alguna, diversa. ¿no? Gracias. Thank you. So unfortunately we don't have time for further questions, but I want to thank you again for the opportunity to share all this information with you. Muchas gracias.